some some activities we have in the week, uh, germplasm bank, and I've entitled this seminar "Gems or Jewels." Um, and just to to put everyone on the same um, understanding, you know, a, a gem is considered to be a precious stone, and a jewel is is kind of the uh, the brooch or the crown or the you know or the ring. The jewels are, are assembled into. And the subtitle of the presentation is Are the CG Gene Banks the Crown Jewels of the Organization? And this presentation kind of came about. In fact, I didn't really know what I should be talking about just a week ago. Um, but then Bram sent me an email. It was last Sunday. And the subject of the email was Gene Banks Crown Jewels. And in it, he says, would you have an overview of existing gene banks in the CG system and out, which are, from your perspective, the crown jewels of, of the system? So then I thought, OK, oh, that's right. You know, often the gene bank is considered or is, is called the crown jewels. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Is it the crown jewels or isn't it? Um, and so, so, so I just have two slides on, on what is value, what could we consider to be crown jewels. And I, I found this um, description of value quite interesting, particularly this first section. focusing on human society rather than biological systems. And so it's kind of bizarre that we have economists here um, at a biological institute. Um, uh, but ne nevertheless, the economic value of plant genetic resources therefore derive from, of course, human use. And that human use can be for food, fiber, uh, medical production, but it also can be for aesthetics, for ecosystems, and for social support functions. So I thought that was very interesting. And this is just kind of a, a description of, of what I've just said. We can have direct use, that's for, for, um, for, for, for food or fiber. We can have indirect use, um, that's for the future needs of genetic resources. Um, we can have the option value, that, that is um, kind of uh, that the, the genetic resources are there to be used if they need to be used. And then the bequest value is, is let me get this correct, is um, the bequest value is, uh, refers to the utility utility individuals gain from mo knowing that future generations will have the opportunity to enjoy an asset. So, so the gene banks encompass all of these types of values. Um, what I'm going to talk about today are germplasm subsets and the gene bank platform has in its history in the last probably 40 years of of CGIAR gene banks, most of the activities have been uh, focused on conservation of genetic resources. But just in the last few years, particularly with the, the advent of um, the, the CRPs, the AFS CRPs, um, uh, there's been more of a focus on utilization of genetic resources. Kind of the understanding that it just conserving res genetic resources isn't enough, but, but actually uh, providing enhanced access um, to those genetic resources and encouraging the utilization of the genetic resources is an important component. So um, the, the question really is how can we promote use of uh, gene bank materials? Uh, the next one is what do clients want? This has been a really difficult um, question to answer because sometimes we don't know who the clients are. Um, uh, sometimes their wants are, uh, or desires are, are very idiosyncratic. 
vague, very vague. In fact, Denise got a request yesterday from, um, on you know, our electronic uh, system, and it was like five, set, five words, and it said, please send me all of your seeds. <laughs> so, and from someone in Maryland, and I googled that, that individual, and it seems like they're a real person. A real person. So, they cannot have all of our no, no, and and of course, um, what do, what do clients want, and then do we have what they want? Um, that's an important thing. And how can we make the materials more accessible? And then are the subsets uh, a valid mechanism to do this? So I just want to point out to you that the Gene Bank platform, um, when it comes to evaluation of genetic resources, the Gene Bank platform provides zero funding for the evaluation of, uh, uh, of the materials that we hold in the Gene Bank. Um, the, the principle behind the Gene Bank platform's stance on this is that we don't want to duplicate efforts um, between, well, between uh, CRPs, the Gene Bank platform, and CRPs, or within an organization. And hence, from my point of view, I mean, from the wheat side of the Gene Bank, we have a reliance on CRP wheat and on our partners to do phenotyping and hopefully to provide data back to us. So this unfortunately kind of makes me a data scavenger. I feel kind of like a vulture coming and, and, and picking data uh, from colleagues, but um, fortunately colleagues have been very willing to share data. And so, um, so we've prepared subsets of germplasm and, and those subsets are are hopefully all based on verifiable published results, either published in, in uh, journal articles or on Dataverse or on Germinate or Grin Global. Um, they're based on colleagues or external data, in, internal or external data. Um, we often interpret the data um, and we don't provide the raw data, but uh, we, we would say, if someone evaluated for heat tolerance, we would select the five best lines that were heat tolerant and not the hundred. We wouldn't list the hundred that, that would be um, presented. Um, uh, the subsets should contain both positive and negative controls. Um, and it uh, needs to, oh, oh and, and one of the, struggles we've had was to just the ontological terms to describe um, the, the different subsets. So should we say the materials are resistant or we're providing resistance? Now this kind of seems trivial, but it's important when it comes to searching. What would the clients use? What terminology would clients use when they're searching for materials? Do they want rust resistance or do they want rust resistant materials? And so, so we have to consider those types of things. And, and also, should it be resistance that we're providing or tolerance that we're providing? For me, resistance is black and white. You know, we provide this, it's, it's solidly resistant. Whereas tolerant is, okay, well maybe under your conditions, you know, under our conditions, it's, it's black and white. Under your conditions, it might be gray. And so, so um, those are things that we have to consider. And certainly what we're wanting in terms of ontolo ontology is to have it to be searchable. So usually the acknowledgments come at the end of the presentation. Here I'm going to give them up front. Um, so I want to acknowledge all of the research teams uh, at CIMIT that have provided data. This is Carlos Guzman, Carolina Sansaloni, Masahiro, Matthew, Sukvinder, and Susanna. Um, I want to uh, recognize uh, different groups. The CAGE, CAGE is the CIMIT, um, uh, uh, CIMIT Australia Germplasm Exchange. Now it includes ICARDA, so it's CIMIT Australia ICARDA Germplasm Exchange. 
uh, the International Nurseries and Seeds of Discoveries. I want to recognize the more than 120 uh, publications that we've gleaned information out of. Certainly the Gene Bank platform is CRP Wheat. Um, the, the team within the uh, Wheat Germplasm Bank is acknowledged and certainly my, my data um, scientist colleagues, uh, Kate Rosemary and Marty Reisinger at USDA. So um, I just want to t tell you about some of the subsets uh, uh, that we've, we've uh, published. And all of these subsets are now published on Green Glo Global on, uh, and on Germinate, c kind of. And um, the, we're in the process of putting them on Genesis. So Susanna Dreitzegacher um, has provided an enormous amount of data, 47 different genes. We have the, uh, the data listed in Green Global, and based on that, um, uh, we can say to, that, that materials are resistant, or that contain the gene or do not contain it. The gene is present or the gene is absent. Um, <coughs> we had wanted to use the DART seq data to do this, um, uh, and we have a project between Carolina Sansaloni, and now it's with um, the John Innes Center, in which uh, we are blasting known gene sequences on the DART-seq data. And so that's really very exciting, and I hope that um, something uh, comes out of that very soon. Because then we would have the characterization of, of the 80,000 uh, accessions that we've, we've um, characterized. From Susanna's uh, SNP data, some of the things that are, are really quite surprising to me are, is that SR2 is absent in a large portion of the, the materials that she's screened. SR2 is a foundation for stem rust resistance in the wheat program. It's a gene that Dr. Borlaug used, um, and it was really the foundation of that resistance. But I suppose because of UG99, um, uh, uh, SR2 has dropped out of the CIMIT population. Also, SR2 is related to pseudo-black chaff, which is a, is a pleiotropic uh, characteristic, and maybe that is affecting, negatively affecting yield. So perhaps that's why it's dropped out. Uh, interestingly, the CIMIT germplasm contains the VRN1 allele, which is a winter type. So all of our materials are spring wheat, but there's an, a winter allele that seems to be fixed in the, the uh, CIMIT uh, International Nursery Germplasm. So that's kind of interesting too, because that's of course affecting the phenology of uh, our materials worldwide. Interestingly, also RHT1, which is the tall gene, is fixed. Uh, predominantly in the, the materials. We always talk about semi-dwarf materials, but, um, and there are two, actually two genes that, that predominantly affect um, the stature. It's RHT2 that is, is providing the semi-dwarfing, but, but we have the um, RHT1 for the tall materials. And the 1B1 R, uh, wheat rye translocation is absent um, from the materials. That is, uh, when I joined CIMIT uh, 30 years ago, 1B1R made an enormous impact um, on the ad adap adaptation of materials uh, in cement germplasm, but now that um, has dropped out too, so that's quite remarkable. Uh, I want to next thank Carlos Guzman's lab. Carlos has provided data to, to to me and, and, and we've put it into Green Global on 38 milling and baking traits on up to uh, uh, 24,000 accessions. And as a consequence, currently we have 16 uh, quality subsets. And one of the surprises about this material is the kind of diversity of, of products uh, that the flower is, is suitable for. Interestingly, um, a few years ago, when Carlos was initially doing these uh, analyses, the, the 
flour types that were suitable for tortillas was very low in the population because Simit previously had, had focused on um, leavened bread, kind of commercial bread products. And so it was kind of ironic that Simit based in Mexico didn't have very much germplasm that was suitable for Mexican tortillas. Um, and, and equally, uh, the, the steamed breads that are... are um, popular in China, the, the, the frequency of materials for steam breads was also quite low. But now it's, it's encouraging that uh, all of these types of uh, bread types uh, are found in, in the, the Simit gene pool and are conserved in the gene bank. A quick, qu quick question, Tom. Are, are these accessions that were g phenotyped for quality, were they only from the elite breeding program, or did this include land races and, and They're only from the elite, oh, yeah, okay. exactly. So, so, you know, we're not, we, we aren't paying for the, once again, the, the, the phenotyping. This has been done uh, on a routine basis for the breeding programs, and, and then we extract the data, Car or Carlos provides the data for that, on materials that we hold in the gene bank. So again, being a, a data uh, scavenger or vulture. Um, I want to thank uh, Matthew's lab for providing uh, uh, data on a, a whole range of germplasm representing 30, 39 um, physiological, wheat physiological trait subsets now. And here's just a long list of, of those types of traits. That's been really uh, excellent. So if someone wants drought tolerance or if they want deep water extraction, they can get germplasm that is, is specifically uh, appropriate for for those particular needs. Uh, I need to recognize Seeds of Discovery because um, uh, we have uh, all of that data in, uh, in well, available. And we've re developed a reference or core subsets uh, of materials. So of course we have the Mexican land races and the Iranian land races. But then there's a, a whole suite of uh, other characteristics that Seeds of Discovery has phenotyped and, and um, uh, reference sets have been developed uh, for, for that purpose. Um, I want to thank the International uh, Wheat Improvement Network partners for providing data. And, and that data, that's the, basically that's international nursery data, has been analyzed by Jose, by Zach, and by Juan Bergeno. Um, and and the, the best of the materials have been identified for subsets um, it, that we contain that, that material in the gene bank. And we've done an analysis for low yielding environments, for high yielding environments, for overall broad adaptation, and this kind of middle group here. And we can also identify materials um, in the, the gene bank holdings that now are uh, drought tolerant, heat tolerant, have high yield potential, and have broad adaptation. So that's really great. Uh, I need to acknowledge the CIMIT Australia Germplasm Exchange Program. This is a GRDC funded project. In fact, it started a few years ago when, it, when Australia realized because of their very strict quarantine regulations that they didn't really have any data that could correlate with the CIMIT data, the CIMIT worldwide data, because it, all of the Australia uh, materials have to go through a, a greenhouse before it can be planted in the field. So they set up this exchange program to specifically address that. And so, um, and one of the aspects of that is that Australia does a, a extensive characterization now for, for three types of nematodes, for root rots, for all three rusts, for septoria, for quality characteristics that are suitable for the Australian market, and micronutrient toxicities, boron and and um, cadmium and that sort of thing. And, and they've also done an evaluation of the synthetic hexaploids. So we have that data in Green Global now as well. Um, I have to thank Masahiro's lab. Um, of certainly the, the, the data that's come out is, is a product of Mujib Kazi, uh, David Bonnet, and Bohoja. And um, so synthetic hexaploids have been characterized. We have that data uh, available in Green Global. There's novel sources from David Bonnet. There are not novel sources of RHT uh, semi-dwarfing. So that's really great. And, and we have uh, materials of the hybrid wheat program, particularly the restorer germ germplasm 
and that's under high demand as well. And finally, I want to recognize Carolina Sansaloni's uh, contribution. Um, uh, we have, uh, oh well, uh, certainly uh, Carolina has been working on the global analysis of, uh, of wheat uh, based on DART seq data, and so that's really a, an enormous contribution. Um, uh, I, I need to mention that in this case, the DART seq data is not contained in Green Global. It's contained in appropriate databases such as Gobi, um, uh, Dataverse has uh, the data, uh, Germinate has some of the data, but not Green Global because Green Global is not set up for, for that type of uh, uh, data. A few weeks ago, we had researchers here from ICARDA and, and SEAT and they're doing a, a gap analysis on the global collection of wheat. And uh, they used Carolina's clusters, the main uh, genetic clusters of materials um, for that analysis. And so that was really great because it's extending the, the seeds of discovery um, data ass assessment beyond just a, a genetic analysis, but looking at um, kind of eco-geographic eco gap analyses. And we have a project with Carolina now on um, assessing within accession heterogeneity and trueness to type um, uh, regeneration integrity. So that's really wonderful. Uh, one last thing that um, Carolina has, has um, has done was that she's identified accessions that appear perhaps to be wrongly identified on a taxonomic basis. And so I think, ah, so, so exactly. So, um, so, so uh, Carolina's work uh, has helped us out particularly. There are materials in the collection that we don't know what the the taxonomic identification is, and so the DART seq data can help us uh, assign that. Uh, <coughs> there are a number of agelops species in which we don't have the expertise here to identify them morphologically, and so DART seq data is helping with that. And um, there's kind of some. It's, sometimes it's difficult to differentiate between bread wheat and durum wheat, and so the, the data is actually helping with that. I just want to mention that we've, ICARDA is also helping us uh, with the, the, the ta taxonomic data um, verification because, of course, they do have the expertise and we are regenerating materials in Lebanon so that they can do that in the field. And I just asked USDA this week how fluid um, the taxonomy, taxonomic um, nomenclature system is in USDA. And um, just last year, there were 2,227 uh, taxonomic name changes in the USDA system. So I think this is just something that happens on a regular basis. As sometimes it's the, the, the name changes, sometimes the identity is recognized as being different, and so this is just kind of a, a, a normal aspect of gene bank management. And in fact, the USDA small grains collection is doing cytological uh, chromosome uh, root tip squashes to actually determine the ploidy of materials because some, as I said, some of the bread wheats and durum wheats are very difficult to distinguish morphologically. So they have to go to a, um, to a, uh, they have to use cytology to do that. Um, so uh, just finally, we just have, I think we have more than 100 subsets now. This is just kind of a cornucopia of, of those subsets. Uh, of course, there's a, a great deal of interest in, um, uh, by popular lay people, uh, by civil society, on heritage wheat varieties. And so we have lists of heritage wheat varieties. And we have this material in the gene bank from Australia, Canada, France, UK, and the United States. Um, uh, we've, we have varieties in the bank that have been identified as tasting good when, when you make bread out of them. We have varieties that are healthy and, and, and of course when you go into the gene bank you see, and you go on the maize side, you see all oh, this beautiful grain, yellow and white and red and blue and purple and everything. And you go to wheat and it looks 
pretty much the same. It's black or uh, red or white. But in fact, we do have blue grain and we have black grain and, and purple grain too in wheat. It's at much lower frequencies, but, but it does exist. Um, then we just have all of these other types of things. Uh, we even have a, a list, a, a subset that's called Bent Scoveman's Freaks. These are kind of really bizarre types of wheats that that Bent just put together. So my, I think the last two slides are, are some of the issues related to subsets. One of them is how do we promote the existence of the subsets? Um, this has been a difficult thing and it kind of relates to this, this penultimate uh, issue. The Simit uh, Gene Bank web page needs to be kind of beefed up. The web page we have now is for Green Global or for Genesis, but it doesn't really tell about the gene bank and, and it doesn't tell how the gene bank is put together and, and what, the, the, what kinds of subsets are available. So we have to do that. Um, uh, just recently, just in the last two or three days, we got an, an announcement from the International Center on Bios, Biosaline Agriculture and the headline said, the, their gene bank has heat tolerant materials. Well, I think we can use the subsets th that we have to promote our gene bank, to say, okay, we have high yielding material, we have drought tolerant material, we have heat tolerant material, we have purple grain material, blue grain material. So we can really use that um, both for the, well, to, to enhance access to the materials, but also to promote the gene bank to the outside world. Um, uh, one open question is that th this subset data is in Green Global, it's in Germinates, it's in Genesis, but none of these systems were really developed to manage s sets of materials. They're all managed to, 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 they're all designed to manage individual accessions. And so how do we manage these subsets? Uh, that's kind of an open question. And we need to, to, to get to the stage of um, th that users can just say, uh, you know, they can just make a Google search, heat tolerant wheat, and zoom, they're taken to that subset. And so how we do that, I don't know, but that's what we have to do. Um, and so, from my perspective, the real crown jewels of the CGIAR are the, the gems would be known and unknown genes, uh, unruly uh, land races, rough crop wild relatives. The jewels would be the accessions, kind of tamed land races, pre-bred materials. But from my perspective, really the, the <coughs> most important crown jewels of the CG system are not the gene bank. You know, it's always said the gene banks are the crown jewels, but from my perspective, the, the, real crown, genetic, the real crown jewels are all of the genetic resources managed by and accessible to CIMIT or other CGIAR centers, from partners to gene banks to the research and breeding programs and ultimately to farmers. And so that's what I think. It's the entirety of the materials that we manage and, and that is the accessions, the germplasm, the data, the knowledge, the use and the impact of those materials. So with that, I'd like to thank you. Questions, comments, clarification? The quality evaluation that was done, you said there were 24,000 accessions evaluated. Were they evaluated for all of the use traits? Um, not for all traits. Uh, and, uh, and it's... So it's the breeder's material that comes in that's been evaluated. And so it changes over time. Um, what <coughs> is. But, but, but I would say that there's probably 40 traits that are common. Because you had about 4,000, I mean just over 4,000 accessions that were highlighted as good for these particular um, use criteria. So right. tortillas versus uh, leaven bread. Yeah. What, what was wrong with the other 20,000 of them? Um, well, they weren't classified by Carlos. Okay, so he maybe so. just hadn't tested them. That was the question. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. 
And I, I kind of like those, those use categories because it's really connecting us to, to farmers or to, to household users or to, to millers and bakers. <coughs> Kenmore Paul, and then, and then Terry Molnar. It's working. Yeah, it's working. Do you have any sense, so outside of cement breeders, outside of cement wheat breeding programs, how common is it in the rest of the world to go all the way back to a bank accession and breed with that? Is that, because it, just to put it in context, in maize, that's extremely rare now. But I don't have an idea in wheat how common that would or would not be. It's interesting, the, the user communities, I think, because for wheat, most of our requests are extremely specific. So the, the requester says, I want this one line, or I want these five lines. And so I think... Um, to answer your question, it, it's kind of, it depends on the, the maybe savviness or the, the uh, kind of where the user community is. And for crops like wheat and maize that have an enormous investment in it, um, they don't have to go back to the early materials. They're looking really for the advanced materials. So you're right. And Conmore Paul. <clears throat> right, who's next? No more questions, clarifications? What, do we have any idea what percentage of the world would still be uh, where wheat is a very important, let's say the main crop? What percentage are still growing in old land race? Let's just even to limit it to, to India, and maybe Karnwapal would know more, but I don't know. They, pretty much everybody is growing improved varieties now. There's not such a, like you have in parts of Latin America, including Mexico, this cultural heritage of keeping a land race that your community's grown, or is that? But, there is that. So in Turkey, in the transitional zone particularly, land races continue to be grown. In Iran, um, there's more than three million hectares of a particular land race called Sadari that is grown. Um, Afghanistan, there'd be areas of, of land race use. But one of the issues that we have in the gene bank platform is um, whether further collecting needs to be done to fill gaps in the collection. And from my perspective, I would say for wheat, that's not necessary. Because the global collection of wheat is estimated, of course there's gonna be duplications, but it's estimated between 800,000 accessions and 1.3 million accessions. And so you would think that, that most of the genetic diversity that's in situ has been collected already. That's my guess. Yeah, Marianne. something in a very unique manner and so I mean your term about scavenging uh, in I mean I, I understand why you use it in terms of saying hello guys this is all your data you are the contributor and here I acknowledge that without that you wouldn't be able but uh, it goes a little bit as well to a deeper issue uh, and which we have discussed and we will discuss again next week and that is about data sharing internally in CIMIT. I mean, uh, put yourself into, let's take Volkswagen, uh, producing VWs. Yeah, we all know those cars. And imagine there is a staff that says, hello, this is my gearbox. I will not share this gearbox so we can put together a car. And obviously, with that example, everybody starts to laugh. What essentially it results is that Volkswagen will be failing. Yeah. And so, because all their cars will be going out without the gearbox, yeah. And so, I mean, what we are doing all together um, is, uh, is for what CIMIT is ultimately able to produce. Most of what we do relies on each other, including the HR person that pays your salary and the finance people that process 
the payments, yeah. Uh, but having said that, is as well that there is some protection that people cannot steal your data. And that is, you have the privilege, if you generate the data, to be, to have, be the first author, the author that creates the publication. But that does not prevent you from sharing the data. Uh, and if somebody else takes your data and puts them up uh, and publishes it and says, this is my data that I generated and does not give you the right credit, then the other person is at fault and will face a disciplinary action. So there is protection in this organization about what some people feel that is stealing. But we absolutely rely on people sharing the data. Yeah, And if you don't share the data internally, and somebody else relies on it, our car goes out without the gearbox or much delayed. And then you face a frown and maybe a stronger frown from your program director or at one stage as well from the DG office. So, so there is protection. We, hopefully you are all able to process your data into publications within a reasonable time period because at one stage hello, maybe you don't have the time and somebody else should publish them or you should work with somebody else to publish them because having them in your cupboard, it doesn't help it, yeah. But if you, so we all rely on sharing data internally. Proper acknowledgement, as you did it very nicely, and you have a right for first authorship, take it and grab it and that gives you the protection. Well, I feel fortunate to be at CIMIT because colleagues have been very more than happy to share data with me. Um, and I hear stories from other centers in which that's not necessarily the case. Um, and so, and but the, of course the issue of acknowledgement is important and that's again kind of a failure of our current databases because they're not set up for these kind of s sets of materials and so our acknowledgement of the materials is kind of in a different section, but, but it works out, I guess. But thanks, Marianne, I appreciate that. All right. Okay, thank you, Tom. Now let's proceed to the next topic. And welcome to our new member of the GRP team. Filippo Guzon, who will talk about seed conservation and ecology of wild relatives and land races of maize and wheat. Okay. Hello? Yeah. yeah, much better. Yeah. Okay, so one of the most characteristic land races of north of Italy is this one. It's called beaked maize. We call it maize rostrato in Italian because it, it has beaked kernels, as you can see. And yeah, it's, it's, it's quite peculiar. But, uh, and it is said to have originated somewhere 
at the mid of 19th century, uh, probably due to crosses uh, between local flint corn and subsequent introduction of material from the Americas. Then it experienced a period of very great success between the two world wars, when it was one of the most appreciated land races group in our regions for the production of polenta, at that, at that time was the staple food for us. And then it experienced a great period of decline uh, after the 30s with the first introduction of improved flint lines as well as a massive, uh, then a massive decline after the Second World War when hybrid dent corn was introduced. So let's say that before our investigation, it was thought that the few land races that survived to genetic erosion in Italy were limited to mountain area, to alpine areas, because then they were like physically isolated from the hybrid dent monoculture that dominated the plain or the low, the low part of the, um, of the hills. But this was a little bit challenging when actually found this land race uh, still cultivated in, well, in the hometown where I grew up, which is very close to Milan, so one of the biggest urban areas in Europe. So we ask ourselves whether this mountain refugia hypothesis was true or if there was still much more diversity to be found and not only uh, in the mountains. So what we did was to basically do an old style ethnobotanical survey interviewing lots and lots of farmers uh, asking about the seeds they were cultivating, where they got them, the origin and how far they could trace back uh, the, their land races and also while well, traveling along uh, around all the different regions. So what we found was that we found 28 different land races of this kind of maize, uh, 18 previously unknown and not conserved in any gene bank. So we collected them and we stored them in the gene bank. So as you can see, only 10, uh, actually eight, are restricted to mountain areas well, all the others live in plain, as well as in lowlands, in low hills, and so on. And these tell us that, of course, cultivation in the mountains played a role in the survival of some of these land races, but the key factor was that what, what we call in, in Europe the custodian farmers, so people that in these 70 years took care of cultivating and maintaining purity, those accession, those land races, and especially it was really nice to investigate the different methods they put in place. Uh, for example, sowing, uh, calculating the sowing time of hybrids as well, and land races so that they didn't flower together. Or for example, of course, sowing them far from each other. And in many cases also sowing in uh, grassland, in clearings, inside forest, so that they, can, they couldn't crossbreed. So here you have an overview of the diversity, at least in terms of years, of this big maze that we found and that we then uh, stored. And it was also very interesting from a, let's say, socioeconomic point of view, to notice that until the 90s, uh, all those land races were cultivated for family production. So basically, they were heirloom varieties that the farmers still were keeping for you know, to keep alive a family uh, tradition. But then after the end of the 90s and massively during the, two, the, the 2000, uh, basically all of them except from one, they are all commercialized in a very local scale. And of course with the interaction synergy between the uh, local consumers and the local farmers, this is something really not guided by any institution, by the government or anything, but still they are becoming very popular, for example, this guy in a very lovely village in, in the hills near Bergamo as a restaurant based only on the products of this land race and is making some good money out of it. And this land race was imported in the United States where it's becoming very popular recently. And of course, a lot of different products are being experimented out, not only the traditional ones. So my take home messages about this first chapter is that of course that still a lot of material can be found even in a, in a place like the north of Italy where it was, I mean, it was collected in several, was 
yeah, there were a lot of different collecting missions along the years, but still a lot of material can be found. And then an ethnobotanical approach can be a powerful tool to detect those plant genetic resources. Then, of course, the importance of custodian farmers who kept in situ or on farm uh, for all these years, uh, also allowing those land races to evolve uh, during the years. And, of course, this, there was also a nice example of the revival of those land races. Uh, there, are, there is a lot of example in Europe of genetic erosion, but recently also of revival of increase of cultivation of some land races. So, one of the genus I work a lot also during my study was Agilovs, which is the secondary gene pool of wheat. And also because Italy is uh, the richest country in the Western Europe in terms of Agilov species. So in our gene bank, it really played a very important role. But of course, in the seed bank of this genus, I had really to start from the basics because it's very it's quite awkward that, you know, there are some genus in which we have a lot of information, such as Agilovs. I mean, it's a very well-studied genus, but then we don't know, I mean, there is nothing published or not much published about its germination. So I had to start really from the beginning and, for example, understanding the germination requirements in terms of thermal, of different temperatures, of thermal treatments. So what I found out that that Agilovs germinate basically happily. At, diff at all different temperature treatments. Uh, so even at 10 degrees, you have a germination of higher than 60%, but it does its best at alternating temperature. Here I tested nine different uh, species collected in, in Crete, in Greece, as well as in Italy. And so you can see that at, tw at uh, 2010 alternating temperature, so 12 hours of 20 and 12 hours of 10 degrees, it always germinates close to the 100% in all the species. And this is a typical response of species uh, living in open habitats and dispersing near the soil surface so that they respond to the variation, the day night variation in temperatures. So alternating temperatures promoted the germination in Agilovs. Secondly, I, I wanted to understand also the drought resistance at germination level. Um, in, in this genus, and I pick as study species uh, Agilops geniculata because it's the most diffused in the, in the Mediterranean area, is really common and lives in different habitats, still ruderal and very dry habitats, but is very well diffused. And I compared with land races and cultivar uh, of triticum. So what I did, I, I, I chose three different uh, populations, so the northernmost, uh, from Italy, one more central, and one in the deep south in the region of Calabria. And so I, to, to study drought resistance, I used uh, different uh, osmotic potential with uh, polyethylene glycol, which is a lab method to imitate, to mimic uh, drought uh, resistant. So what I found, yeah, first of all, we are talking about quite low osmotic potential. Still, below one megapascal, we, have, we see quite good germination. So this means that being a wild species is a quite drought resistant at germination stage. But I found very, very big differences among population. So the southernmost population, this one behaved similar to the cultivated varieties. And this germination was not affected by osmotic potential. While uh, on the other end, the northernmost population were affected by osmotic uh, potential. So you see a very big differences among uh, the populations. So I try to correlate that uh, with environmental data. And what I found out is that the germination at the lower most potential, lower, lower most potential, so the highest level of drought was correlated, negatively correlated with the rainfall uh, during the seed maturation period. So that is uh, the, <coughs> sorry, uh, this, the population who experienced the lowest level of, of rainfall uh, was also the one who germinate the best under the lowest uh, osmotic uh, potential. On the other end, the, the, the population who germinate the lowest under the lowest uh, germination potential was the one who experienced the highest rainfall. Of course, this is just based on three populations. So, I mean, it's just a speculation, but it tells us that it's possible uh, that the rainfall experienced by the mother plant 
can uh, influence then the germination response uh, of, the, of the seeds produced. So we can say that alternating temperature promote higher, fi uh, higher final germination in agilobes, that agilobes geniculata is drought resistant with very big significant differences in final germination uh, among populations. So finally, I also study seed longevity uh, in agilobes. Seed longevity is a very important seed trait because, uh, of course, it allows the seed to persist in the soil but of course also to survive uh, in the gene bank. So it's, it's really important for us that we are working uh, in gene bank. Uh, so first of all, uh, basically cleaning a lot of the material. I noticed that the um, agilops show seed heteromorphy, which is the production of different uh, seed morphs by the same uh, mother plant. And especially uh, within a within spikelet seed dimorphism, with the production of a bigger and a smaller seed. And moreover, I divided the genus into different groups based on their spike morphology. So there are species like Agil of Geniculata, this one, uh, in which the spike disarticulate at maturity in a lot of different spikelet. And those spikelet can have a dimorphic pair or just one single seed. On the other end, there are other species in which the spike does not disarticulate at maturity, so stay intact. So this is Agilos buncialis, perhaps, in which we have a lower fertile spikelet um, with a dimorphic seed pair, and sometimes also an upper fertile spikelet with one or two seeds. And in general, the small seeds are darker colored. So here you have an overview of the two morphology. So based on previous literature on similar species, um, showing a similar, the same kind of seed dimorphism. It was hypothesized that the big seed germinate soon after the dispersal, while the small seeds stay dormant and germinate later on during, during the season. So I wanted to understand a bit more the germination phenology of this genus, as well as test if there, if there are different seed longevity between the seeds. And so uh, what I did is to do two kinds of treatment, a control aging test, which is a lab method to evaluate uh, seed longevity. So you just basically do accelerating aging to be able to test in a reasonable amount of time seed longevity. And also it allows you to compare, um, to compare different accession based on their longevity. And it says that can also a little bit predict longevity in gene bank condition. And moreover, I did a field experiment to clarify the, uh, the phenology of these species. So this is what I found out in the lab, here with the agile of geniculata cylindrica I showed you before. Uh, we can see that in the, the large seed, here with the, the dark curve, yeah, its viability uh, uh, declined quicker than the small seed with the, with the red curve. So the small seed is longer lived than the large one. And we have the, the single seed, which has an intermediate behavior. Same with the, with the, with the other the species with the other morphology, in which the small seed uh, is longer lived than the large one. It's a very significant difference, uh, two-fold higher differences, so something really significant. Moreover, I complemented this uh, with field experiment, in which basically I imitate what happens in nature. So I saw the spikelet in the first layer of the soil, and time by time I checked the, em uh, the emergence of the different seed morphs, also detecting temperature and humidity in the field. So what I found out is that the large seed germinated after eight, nine weeks after dispersal, while the small one stayed dormant for 14 months, uh, completely viable, and germinate one year after uh, the large seed, so here, 14 months after dispersal, probably also due to the presence of an inhibitor that imposed dormancy uh, on the, just on those small seeds. So this is called, well, we can say that this is called, this is a bet edging strategy. So it's, a, it's an ecological strategy of species living in rural or difficult environments like Agilops does. Uh, so there is the production of different seed morphs they germinate in different times, uh, so spreading the germination events or almost, basically almost over two years, so that at least one 
of those uh, fraction of seeds of those seed morphs can hopefully germinate in the right period and establish, and establish successfully seedlings. So we are continuing with this investigation, uh, with this paper in preparation, almost ready to be submitted, uh, testing many more other species, also the genus Triticum, which shows the same uh, dimorphism, and evaluating a lot of different seed functional traits. And one of the things I like the most is that the longevity estimate positively correlated uh, with antioxidant potential phenolic compounds that we know are really important, uh, you know, to, to, to prevent the damage from reactive oxygen species that, of course, are really detrimental uh, during the aging process. And so here, for example, in, this, in these two species, you can see that the small seeds are longer lived, but at the same time, they have a higher uh, phenolic compound, <coughs> level of phenolic uh, compound. So the two things are, are correlated. So finally, we also uh, we did this PCA, considering all the different seed functional traits and parameters we studied uh, in terms of seed mass, germination, germination of seeds in the, in the, inside the spikelet, germination timing, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we found out the, the different uh, seed lots uh, cluster in two very different groups, regardless of the species. So we have the large seeds that cluster together and the small one, considering all, uh, a lot of different uh, seed traits. So we can see how this seed uh, heteromorphism really involves a lot of different functional traits, seed functional traits. Di um, not only dimorphism itself, but also um, dormancy and longevity and you know, physiology and many, many, many other things. So I can say that seed heteromorphy is a widespread feature in wheat wild relatives, but probably not only because I spotted also in rye as well as in, uh, in hot, in different uh, cereal genera. That is, a com of course, in wheat wild relatives, we have a complex germination ecology and we still have to fully clarify it and disentangle the different uh, you know, effects. And at the seed heteromorphy influenced seed longevity. And what I'm trying to clarify now also with the help of IPK gene bank and perhaps we can do also with the material here in the wheat gene bank, because I saw that seed, uh, seed heteromorphy influenced seed longevity in the field and also in the control aging testing in the lab. So I would like to understand whether there is a difference between of the viability uh, of the different morphs also at gene bank condition. So if perhaps the, the, the small seeds li live longer also in a gene bank. And so this, I think, can have also, is, is relevant also for our gene bank management and so to plan our propagation or recollection intervals. So how am I going to apply this, let's say, experience on my uh, new, new position? So I would like to analyze the longevity data of the seed meat maize collection. We have uh, some good data along the years, and I would like to uh, well under, and understand more about the longevity in gene bank condition of our maize collection. I think this can help us in improve also the management and in planning uh, the propagation. I would like to improve the seed processing and conservation, not only here in the gene bank, but also in other environments, which probably are more challenging, like community seed bank, where we need really to improve the seed longevity and vigor uh, a long time. And I also would like to clarify germination requi requirements of maize wild relatives, because there are a few species really endangered, let's say, for example, Ziani caraguensis, for which we don't have yet a germination protocol, and they show uh, seed dormancy and problems in germination, and I would like to clarify that. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, I, ha Whoa. I have a couple of questions. Yeah. One of them, at least in the, the way I understood your example, not mm -hmm. only were you comparing seed size, but you were looking at seed location. So it's right, primary, seed secondary. Yeah. So does the, does the size also relate to longevity if you take from the, say, primary seeds only, bigger versus smaller? Uh, and then the second question is, why would you only do this for the maize collection? Why not also look at the wheat? I start from the second. If they allow me, I will also do for the second, for the wheat collection. 
And about the first, yes, I also check um, seeds from different spikelets, the different spikelet position. And of course, not, only, not in all the species is possible because some of them disarticulate and so well, it's done. And while, but while for others you can do it, and I found the same difference in longevity and in germination. In general, the seeds of the first, let's say the basal spikelet, do better than the one of the upper ones. But still, also in the upper spikelet, you still find most of the time dimorphism and this, on the same level, the same kind of dimorphism that influence also antioxidant, longevity, and, and so on, dormancy, yeah. The experiment that you did looking at germination under different osmotic regimes, mm -hmm. were those populations collected directly from the field? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. what other experiment could you think of doing to try and tease apart whether you're looking at a, a genetic effect that's heritable or an epigenetic effect that you might have seen from the effects of rainfall on the mothers. Yeah, actually they found something similar in uh, in Triticum dicocoides, and what they did, and I would like to replicate, is that they saw those different from fresh, freshly collected material in the wild, and then they replicated it in a closed environment, let's say in a glass house, giving uh, different water treatments. And so basically they, they try, of course, to disentangle the, these, those effects and see if giving the mother plant different water treatment, this had an effect uh, on seed germination and resistant to drought, and as I found in, in the white. So it would, it would be nice to do that. More question, clarification, comments? No, well, thank you, Filippo, and let's proceed to the next presenter who will discuss about how do you rescue land race, the case in Hala. Please welcome Denise. No, it is working. Okay, great. So uh, I'm going to talk to you today about um, a project that uh, has been going on for a while. Practically, I got started on it when I first came. So it's, now it's building a lot of steam. And I thought it would be good, a good time to talk to this group about it. Um, and I'm, I'm going to do sort of what Tom did. I'm going to acknowledge people in the beginning. I believe his acknowledgment was somewhere in the middle of his talk. But anyway. This is the beginning. So uh, the HALA team, I'm calling it, is actually a group of teams. And um, in GRP, myself and Christian Zavala, we are, we're kind of um, running the show in that area. And uh, Cesar and Angela are working on the genetics side. So we're, we're working on the, the field logistics side. And uh, they're working on the, on the uh, on the molecular genetics side. Um, we also collaborate with Carolina Camacho from Socioeconomics, and Dagoberto was called back in out of, out of uh, retirement to work with us. We had a fantastic summer with him last summer, and also uh, Carolina's team. Every, everyone's really contributed a lot to the socioeconomics side. Um, we also have Renato Olmedo, who is the hub manager um, 
out there in Nayarit, and he also has been a, a key a key actor in uh, in our work out in Nayarit. Um, from INIFAP, we have Victor Ridal, who basically um, he's the person who invited me to go to Nayarit and to go to Hala to begin with, and so it kind of started with the two the two of us. Luis Armando is a student who's been working with with uh, Victor. Um, we've also had students uh, at our end here. Uh, Vivian Bernal, who's now a doctor, so she's no longer um, a student, but she was a, a Borlaug fellow with us, and uh, she's now the new Mays curator at the USDA collection. So we have a, a wonderful uh, friend and colleague uh, in our sister bank, so we're really happy, and she's continuing to work with us on this project and, and others also. Um, Aaron, I'll talk a little bit about him, and Vanessa was a... Um, Global Crop Diversity Trust Impact Fellow, and she came out and was with us in Hala uh, this last summer. Uh, we also have a lot of Hala collaborators, um, and this is just a few of them, actually. There, there are many more, but these are some of the really key people that have been working with us um, you know, for two, three, or even more years. And I um, have to say about the funding, we, we got some small uh, USAID linkage fund grants uh, that were, uh, we were linking with Cornell with uh, one of my former colleagues in the Buckler Lab, um, Mike Gore, so he's also involved here. And, and also the Gene Bank platform, we've also uh, used funding from, from that uh, source, of course. Okay. so. How do you rescue a land race? Well, how did this all start? Um, I, I got to know about Hala uh, actually even before I came to, to Simit, but uh, my interaction directly with Hala Mays began in the summer of 2013 when I uh, was a judge in the Hala um, Largest Maze in the World Contest, and uh, Victor uh, uh, volunteered me for that job, and um, I've been doing it ever since, so I've done it every year now. Uh, since 2013, and um, it's just a fantastic experience, and it also really, you know, introduced me to a community that really values their land race, and it's it's uh, iconic for them. They're very, they're very uh, excited and interested in it, and uh, that really gave me a lot of. Um, I have to say, I was very, uh, you know, encouraged by the the fact that there are. Uh, still lots of people in Mexico, especially, uh, that uh, are still using their land races and um, so encouraged. It was, it was a very really nice introduction to that. Um, and, you know, we went out there, shucked the maze that was brought in by farmers and filled out forms with, with uh, morphology. Mostly the length of the ear is the one, the important trait. The other encouraging thing was kids also. Um, uh, participate. Not a whole lot of kids, but, but yeah, we have, we have kids that are, are participating. Um, but then it's still, it, that this interaction continued, um, and uh, I want to point out that those boys down there were the boys from 2014, and they're still, they're still in it, in the game, and the one on the right won the contest last year. So um, that's kind of a cool side side fact there. But it continues, but now, now at, since 2017, it continues with a little difference because initially I was just going out there every year having a great time uh, chatting with everyone and, and getting to know people who are maze, maze crazy people like I am, I guess. Uh, but in, in 2016, uh, <laughs> we actually got a little, a little motivation from uh, someone we met out there saying, why do you come out here once a year and do this thing and not do something real. You know. So that made Victor and me uh, reassess you know, what we're doing. Uh, and so we, we decided, yeah, this is the year. In 2017, we started a real project. And um, the, I'm, I'm sort of funny for me to see this title, starting with the word repatriation, because actually this is a rematriation. And uh, we can talk about that idea later. But in the beginning, we were using the, the classic term, repatriation, and creating a baseline for tracking genetic diversity, a study of the giant maize land race. So 
um, what, what we were seeking was some kind of clear understanding of the current status of genetic diversity in this land race, both in the farmer's fields and compared with what we have in the gene bank. So this was one of our goals. And um, also, we wanted to, to document uh, the impact that this kind of collaboration that we were proposing between our gene banks and the farmers, what would be the impact on uh, the maintenance of the diversity and also the resiliency of farmer's seed systems. So that was an important and it remains a very important goal for us. Um, and also develop a plan for monitoring and preventing the erosion of crop genetic diversity. Uh, no one's really done that that I know of. If anyone knows of something, please let me know. No one's really done this in a case study for a land race, so we decided to get out there and do it. And the, the important point here is we're taking a very multidisciplinary kind of uh, R4D approach because we're combining population genetics with agronomy, with socioeconomics. And when you study a crop plant, that's important because it's the people who grow the crop are doing the selection. And um, I've really come to appreciate that over the last six years of being here that uh, we, can, we can make more impact we can improve livelihoods uh, through our science by really also understanding and taking into consideration the needs and uh, of the people that grow it. So that was the, the background on that. So in, in that year, in 2017, we, we had two students, Luis Armando and Aaron Waybright. Aaron was a, just recently graduated uh, from Cornell. He was a, an undergraduate working in Mike's lab. And he came out and teamed up with uh, Luis Armando, who's, who's a native of Nayarit, uh, to live, they lived in Hala for five months, and they did field work in two, two main areas. One was uh, they were monitoring a field trial that we did using 14 of our historical Hala uh, accessions from the bank. Um, so basically, we're bringing them back to the site of origin and looking at their phenotypes side by side with locally uh, with Hala Mayas from four different farmers. So that was uh, the, our first field trial out there. And also what they, the, these guys did is they, they conducted, reconducted a survey that was done in, uh, in 2001 by a, a, a Cornell graduate student, Ellie Rice, for part of her thesis work. And, uh, she kindly gave us all of her data, and uh, the guys went back out and found all the families um, and re-interviewed them. So, what happened? Okay, um, this is this is a kind of a sad story that's being repeated um, all over uh, Mexico and Latin America. Only 22 percent of the farmers' families who were growing the land race in 2001 are still growing it in 2017. And this gives you an idea of what's, what happened between in the, in the 16 years. Um, you know, most of the farmers were quite elderly when they were interviewed uh, 16 years ago, so we've had, many of them have passed away. But the important thing to, to look at is what happened when in the intergenerational change. Was that knowledge, interest, passion, whatever, was it passed on to the next generation? And this, this, is, the, this is a key, key point, is that, um, whoops, I gotta go back, uh, that you know, farmers are, are aging, land race farmers are aging, and there seems to be um, a drop in turnover. So that um, knowledge, interest, passion, uh, is not being passed on effectively to the next generation. And just in general, what I'm, uh, the story that I'm feeling is, is true right now is that the level of genetic diversity that we're still maintaining for land races is still quite high. Okay, we, we haven't hit that you know, drop off. We have not hit that yet in Mexico. But we, with this, with this uh, phenomenon, of the intergenerational change. This is a critical moment for us in Latin America, in the world, uh, with respect to, to conserving our, 
genetic resources for this crop plant and maybe and probably for others. So that's, I think, well, I mean, one of the overall take home messages that I'm learning from this study, but also from the study we've, we've done, been doing in Morelos, which I should make a pitch because it just got published. The socioeconomic study has just been published, just came out last week in Agriculture and Human Values. So that is now getting out, the word's getting out there. But what the feeling is, is that we're still, we're still maintaining the genetic diversity of the land races, but this is going to be a very critical time for the future. Um, so in last year, we returned to Hala. Um, and this is, we've kind of expanded a little bit. We learned some lessons, of course, from the first year. And um, we started thinking about what can we do, you know. We can, we can observe, we can do research, we can do that kind of thing. What can we actually do? And one of the first things we decided was to start working on creating a diverse starting population. Let's get the diversity, as much diversity as possible, that's still out there in this land race, put it together and start a diverse, like a baseline uh, population. That, that baseline population can then be a community resource that's freely available to anyone in the community who wants to try it, wants to incorporate it into their own, into their own farming. And um, that's what we've kind of, we've, we've launched into that area on the genetic side. On the socioeconomic side, we, we saw many, many interviewees who we asked, you know, what, what would you do? What, what do you think should be done? Is the idea of we need to incorporate young people in um, maize cultivation, in, in understanding what's going on. But they don't know it need to be only farmers. They can be traders. They can be, they can be uh, transformers. There's many ways that the young people can participate, maybe in a different, cooler way than being farmers. Although, of course, obviously, we still need farmers. But uh, this became a focus, one of the foci of, the, of our socioeconomic pro, uh, project. And um, another thing is that not only uh, were we were studying uh, the genetics, but we're also looking at the phenotypes. And we, wanted, we decided we should be expanding more uh, on our understanding of our entire historical collection. So we started out with 13, 14, but we really have a, a bigger collection of accessions where they're, they're called hala. And uh, so we wanted to expand that. And also, we realized that we needed to start looking at what the value chain is like for Hala land race. Uh, because if you don't use it, you lose it. And uh, so that was, that was the area where Dagoberta came in and started helping us with, with that part of the study. Um, just to kind of give you the context of what we learned, what we are learning, um, about on, again, on the socioeconomic side, uh, there's three, three areas that are important to consider. Uh, one in, is the production of, um, of hala land race. It's adapted to deep planting. So it's planted early in the season and it's planted, the seed's planted very deep to, be, uh, to have access to that subterranean humidity. Uh, when, when the seedlings finally hit the hit the hit the air uh, it looks like a desert out there it, it's incredible these little little wimpy fragile seedlings are coming up and, and the the surface is dry it just is incredible but they've got a really healthy strong root system down below and that that is a, a you know a, a very efficient system um, especially for uh, people that are not are just uh, growing under rain-fed rain conditions. Um, but again, it's, their, their uh, cultivation practices are labor-intensive. This was the way we planted our, uh, our field trial was, was with this uh, set, of, set of animals <laughs> doing, the, doing a lot of the work. So it, it's a labor-intensive cultivation practice. If you look at the utilization side, uh, on the positive side, uh, locally, uh, the women of Hala, they, they prefer to use the land race for their own um, home cooking. And also, uh, there are many uh, fondas, local restaurants, 
uh, in fact, our, our two students, they ate at a couple of them all the time. And they also prefer to use the, the land race. And also the street vendors <coughs> use land, use HALA land races. Um, on the negative side, uh, HALA is not particularly competitive in the, um, the husk and grain markets. So that's an area that needs to, we need to probably uh, attend, think, think more about that, and also think a lot more about niche markets. Um, on the appreciation side, well, you know, as I've mentioned, uh, in general, the community really appreciates hollow maize. Uh, they were designated a Pueblo Magico, and part of it is because of this maize mania that they have there and this, this incredibly uh, 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 iconic maize. So, so they, there's a lot of promotion of, of, the, of the maize by having this annual contest. Um, but on the negative side, um, there is no specific government support for growing land race maize in Nayarit. Uh, their support focuses on other, thing, other crops like sugarcane uh, and hybrid maize. So uh, that's an area that needs to be examined. Um, so now uh, we're going to do something a little different. <laughs> we're going to have a, 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 a mini poster session. And we're going to talk about what's over there on the wall. So um, everyone who would like to hear about the genetic study, um, please assemble yourselves over here. Get your coffee, get your cookies or whatever. And um, myself and uh, the molecular genetics team, Cesar and Angela, and also Christian, uh, the four of us are going to talk about what's on the wall over here. So. Everybody adjourn over to this side. Oh, yeah, you guys get to sit in the front. You're in the front row. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, come on over here. <laughs> So, so I'm, I'm going to start out with this like low-tech, homegrown uh, uh, version over here. Um, so, uh, so we, we decided, of course, a very critical part of this study is to understand the genetics, understand the genetic diversity and of both our collection, uh, what we have in, in the bank, and also what is out there currently with the farmers. So basically kind of like an ex situ versus in situ comparison. So uh, since we have uh, sequence data from the Caesar Discovery Project for our collection, we started out by, uh, by using those data that were already available uh, for the ex situ collection. And, um, and then everything over, so that's actually what's over here. This is all of the, uh, from, from the, the bulk sampling that was done for the, um, for the Caesar Discovery Project of the whole, the whole collection. And over here on the other side, this is a collection that we made with the farmers. It's based on their 2016 harvest. Um, and we, we, did in a very fun way. Uh, well, I guess it was fun. It, we we did um, we did a, a balanced composite sampling. So we sampled ears individually from from each farmer. So in this case, actually also over here, but in this case, all of all of these represent a single kernel from a single ear, and where you see multiple ones from the same farmer, those are multiple ears. So we have one seed from each ear from each farmer. We have 28 farmers represented here, and we have a total of 269 ears. Now, if you come up later and want to look at more detail, these are all the farmers. These are their names and how many, how many ears they donated to the project. So it's not the same. Uh, it would be great if it were exactly the same for each farmer. But you know, that's the way it happens. So some farmers had more ears. Some didn't understand that we wanted to collect from ears, so they brought bulks. 
and we couldn't use that because we wanted to co collect from single uh, kernels from single from ears. So anyway, so over here, all of this is collected from from farmers, and over here, all of this is <coughs> from is the and this is all based on sequencing data. It was all done in the Saga lab here in Simit, and. Um, so one thing you notice right away is why the heck do all the ex situs, why are they all over here and all the in situ over here? Okay, so the very first cut, very first difference you see is that. <coughs> so um, Cesar and I were having uh, lots of discussions about this. Um, and uh, actually, this is the second version of this, of this uh, he sent me the first version. Uh, I took it with me. Uh, Christian and I were in Puerto Vallarta looking at our winter nursery. We, we had the, the pencils out. We were coloring it up. And then we get an urgent email from, from Cesar. And he said, no, don't do that one. It's wrong. I'm going to send you a new one. So the next night, we had to go back to We had to take the new version and color it again. I, I think our first version was more beautiful. But anyway. <laughs> We were a little like pressed for time at that time. So, uh, so we just did, you know, freehand um, coloring and everything was, was fun, uh, very bonding for, for us, yes. And uh, we also included everybody else who wanted to, wanted to join in. They all were, they all were coloring the thing. Um, so anyway, uh, well, what you, what you can see, the coloring here, up here, has to do with, there are three towns that we collected from. Okay, so we represent Hala town, a town called Kuapan, which is also in the Hala Valley, and then a third area called uh, La Maceta. So it's outside of the valley on top of the mountains, and that's this, uh, this group down here, the pink ones. Yes. No, not the pink ones, the green ones. So the green ones are over here. This, the green is, the, is from La Cofradia, so that's on the, up in the mountains. Kuapan and Hala are in the valley, okay? And they're very close to one another, geographically close to one another. So um, what you see is the towns kind of separate out, but there's more mixing between Kuapan and Hala. Uh, La Cofradia is a little, little more distinct. Actually, what's funny is that when we first went to Hala, nobody was talking about the maceta. Nobody said anything about it. And poco a poco, talking to people and everything, we find out, hey, we think that they're growing jalamez in the mountains. And so the next thing we know, got to go up there, got to talk to people, got to collect it. And sure enough, they're growing jalamez. The people in, in Hala town said, no, that's not jalamez. That's something else. That's the sour. It's not the same. Um, but in the end, one of the key messages here is they are all in this together. This is their land race. They are together. And that was one of the messages that we were able to, we were able to show because we had to have this for a farmer meeting at the end of January. So we had this. We put it up on the wall just like I'm doing with you guys. We put it up on the wall and we started talking about what's here. And you know, we called it, this is the family tree. You know, like, you know, the grandparents and the parents and things. This is like a family tree. And one of the, one of the cool things was that one of, one of the, the like, most famous winners of the contest, a winner of the contest was there at the meeting. And when I saw he was there, I <coughs> went and did some more coloring. And I, I uh, indicated where he was on here. And here he is. He's here, he's here, he's here, he's here, he's here. He's, he's all over the place, okay? Then you see other people, other farmers that are like here, and that's it. They're all here. And so we talked about that. And so, I mean, what's the bottom line here? We have sharers and we have not sharers. We have people that share their, their, their genetic resources. We have people that don't. We also have a very interesting case. We have a guy who is the only 
this guy, the only in situ farmer whose maize fell over here with the ex situs. That was kind of weird, but Salvador Montes, there he is. And his stuff is like all way far away from everybody else. So there's a lot of patterns, cool patterns going on here. But when I got back here, the first thing I did is I hung this on the wall over there in genetic resources uh, uh, room, and Cesar and I stood there and stared at it for a while, right? Mm -hmm. so, so we stared at it a while. And being scientists, we are skeptical, right? <laughs> that's our, that's our, what we do. So we said, this is weird. Why is ex situ so separate from in situ? So the difference here is the data we have. This material performance. Oh. You have another one? It's on. It's on. Hola. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So the difference here is the data that we use to use to, um, to develop this analysis. In this case, we have bulks. It's very, you can see very clear here. We have bulks from the gene banks and individual kernels from the field, from HALA. Okay. So in this case, we create populations to get one accession sample. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And obviously, here, we use uh, frequencies to analyze it. Yeah? But at the same time, our pipeline creates the counts yeah, that we use to, to calculate the frequencies and what we call um, colors, ones and zeros, which is a binomial um, marker. So we mix, I think we mix here different things. And for this, we have to use frequencies. And for this, we can use the calls, ones and zeros. In this case, well. OK, so, so tell what you did. Yeah. It's the process <laughs> that's important. So um, next step Back was to. to the freezer, basically. <laughs> yeah. Next step was to do um, DNA extraction, extraction from individual kernels of these guys here. Yeah. With this individual DNA extraction, we, do, we did the recall for all these, to get all these new markers. And then we did the same analysis, and we got this one. What we expect to have some kind of mix between gene bank material and uh, the, the material from the, from the field, um, or from HALA. But still we have some coincidence, we can say, because the blue ones are the gene bank material. And they still are, you know, grouping uh, with some, of course, some, but there's some mixes here. A couple that are h hanging out in different areas down in here. Yeah. yeah. And then, well, um, Denise knows better than me that what means from where it's coming each each sample. So maybe you can put some points on some of the samples, interesting samples that we found here. Christian. <laughs> Kristen is the guy who, who knows personally all these farmers. I know some of them, but he actually knows all of them <laughs> because he went to their farms and he had his GPS and he, he got their coordinates. He did all that, but he also talked to them a lot. So, um, so maybe you could just kind of talk about a few just a few examples. Well, yeah, what I found in, in this, in this ca case, I found some, some accessions that are close from the purity um, new collections from Hala Valley. Because in, in, in that case, everything is, is far from each from other. But in this case, I found Naya, Nayarit 56 that is close from the purity accessions, new accessions here. Like this is Naya 50, 56. And we have one accession called like Naya Group 4 that is was made with uh, four different accessions, uh, collections from, from the field. That is Naya 50, 54, 55, 56, and 53. So, but 56 is the, is the best, is the best um, HALA phenotypically uh, accession in, in CIMIT, in the, in the gene bank, comparing in situ with the, with the new accession. So, uh, 
in the in the in the first in the first case, I didn't realize that everything was in this in this side. But in this case, now Naya is is mixed with with some Quapan Francisco Franques that is the best, really best um, phenotypic Hala land race in the field. So this is what I found, and some other cases. Here, but th this is the best case because Naya is the, the representative Hala in, in our collection talking with Victor Vidal because the, he is the expert in, in Naya accessions. And that's one of the cases. But we have some others like Naya 130 and, and other, other, other cases that I need to, to compare in, in the map how close they are one of, of the other. So, so the Naya uh, collections were done, they started collecting them in the 1940s for the Races of Maize studies. So the, they did the Races of Maize studies starting here in Mexico, and the head of that program was Edwin Wellhausen, who was our first DG for CIMIT, right? And our first gene bank manager, Maize <coughs> gene bank manager. So, um, you know, we, we go back and, and look, at the, look at the Bible man, a lot. Uh, but we also are lucky to have so many of those original collections. And so we have, you know, maize from the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, 70s, 80s, all the way up. And they are all mixed in here. But we also found by, by doing the in situ grow outs is we found some things that were called hala in our database are not hala. They're from hala, but they are not hala, hala land race. Um, so, uh, so that has, you know, that, that's another really good side benefit of doing that kind of work is that we can really improve our curation, you know, and then we started thinking, oh my God, I think we sent that one to so-and-so and it's actually not a holla. So, you know, we can fix all that. Um, but it, we were able to fix it by growing it back out in its original. And, and the, re the way we can tell them apart is flowering time, height of the plants, length of the ears, all those kind of traits that we normally take. Um, so there's, there's a lot going on here, and we are literally just starting on understanding this. Um, but, you know, we're going to put this whole story together in the next few months. And I want to acknowledge Angela did a wonderful job with this. This looks a lot more professional than that thing over there. Um, oh, I'm not going to take that one to, to an international conference, but this one, this one's going somewhere. We'll take it out. The outside world will get to see this. And thanks, Angela, for that. And uh, so we invite feedback from everybody, anyone with ideas, anyone that thinks we're doing things wrong, we're doing things right, uh, what new things should we try? Um, one of the things that we're going to do is last summer in 2018, we planted out two sets of our, the full balanced composite. So it was a, a plot with 269 seeds, one seed from every year in the collection. We, we grew them in one plot, uh, let them open pollinate, and then went back out with farmers let them go through and do, do the, the mass selection. You know, there's the, the two levels of selection. And, um, and so now we've got, you know, improved, improved Hala land race. And we're going to, you know, keep building that. So, uh, so yeah, we, we really invite, uh, you know, feedback and, and anybody who wants to join us. The other thing I didn't mention in my talk is that one of the criticisms of the, the contest is that the contest takes place August 14th, which is the green elote stage, but also it's, it's the, the, uh, the saints' day for their village. And so, you know, it's kind of sacred. It's going to always be on August 14th in the green ear stage. But the comments have been why would you harvest your best stuff in the green ear stage? Why, why, that's, that should be the seed for the next, you know, I mean, the standard breeding idea, right? So why are you harvesting it then? So, if, you, um, if they handled it properly, you could probably germinate that seed. The thing is, it all gets 
eaten. Well, yeah. <laughs> like I said, if you handle yeah. it properly. Yeah. Well, you know, there are these, you know, master good. farmers that knock off a few yeah. kernels mm -hmm. and dry them slowly and they germinate. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe not 100%. Right. Right. So, uh, so anyway, so that, that has been a criticism of the, the main contest. So what we proposed was, <coughs> let's have a contest at harvest time. Why don't we do it that way? And uh, so we did. We had the first uh, contest in harvest stage in December during the Saints Day um, celebration of Kuapan. Hey, so the other town got its day in the sun. And uh, we had a fantastic, uh, a fantastic event. We had all the, all the big players that uh, win, the, win the other contest. They brought their stuff. And we had a really nice event. And all of those guys donated their winning ears to a community sea reserve that we're, we're creating. With, uh, so that's the other piece is that uh, there has, they've been showing interest in, in creating a community seed reserve there. And that's something that we're going to look, look at in the future. But we will, event, we will always have the, the community gene pool. The, the, the Hala gene pool will be a, a resource that will stay with the community, freely available. And, um, but it's, it's great to see that we're getting buy-in. few things that are happening now is uh, we have now identified another village in the mountains that grows hala maize and they want to participate. So, you know, we're finding these other pockets of genetic diversity out there. And I think by the end, we will, we will have this sucker nailed. I mean, we will have um, a really uh, fine, fine collection uh, that defines what hala land race is right now. And, and that, you know, will go into the future. So that's our project. Did you include some of the uh, accessions that the INIFA has in that analysis? No. no. Just to no. see how they Yeah. Get. <laughs> yeah, but you can get the DNA from INIFA. Use the microphone, por favor. Use the microphone, yeah, yeah. please. And the other thing was that you mentioned that in the market, HALA is not competitive. Uh, which is the, the, the yield average and which are the main problems, I mean, to increase a little bit the, the yield, if yield is a problem? Um, the, the yield, the for yield. the best, is 7.5 yeah. in the best case with so. good train in the year. The worst is the three. Oh, oh okay. uh, the best is 7.5 uh, tons per hectare. Uh, with Good drains in the year, and the worth is three three tons per hectare, because we have a really a few plants in, in we have twenty the, the best population for per hectare for Hala is twenty two thousand plants, so it's really really poor really the population low, low yeah. density yeah okay so you presented now uh, uh, the genetic information right. Uh, but you know where all this maize came from. Yeah. So you have the location of those fields. Yeah. So we have the environment. Yeah. So we can do a GBIE analysis. You've also interviewed these farmers. Yeah. Yeah? So we also know something about their management practices. Yes. So we can do a G by E by M analysis on this, which is pretty amazing. If we, uh, uh, so we should definitely do that. Mm -hmm. I have a quick uh, comment. Uh -huh. When you presented this, you were quite surprised to see this different. But for me, it makes totally sense, this different. Because if you observe here, you have much more diversity and it's based on the bulk strategy, right? So in here, you are really capturing the diversity of the accession. And in here, you are only sampling one. That if you see like here and here, this group, and when you did that single plant, make more sense for you, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but as a bulk, not. But in the bulk, you are really capturing the whole diversity of the accession. And in here, it's only one. So uh, 
if all our bulks will be all together, for sure. But this is the difference that you observe a completely different group. It's because it's bulk and single plant. And in this bulk, you have much more diversity mm -hmm. per accession. Captured. Yeah, yeah, capture. Yeah, yeah. per accession, yeah. So, I mean, the bulk is really, really cool for me, I think, because yeah. you really capture uh, all diversity. It's not useful for other purpose, but, but for diversity, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really good. I, I, guess, I guess what we were sort of... I think I, I, think oh, I, guess, I, think, I think what we, we are realizing is that you can't really mix them, you know, in the same analysis that you have to keep them separate. Yeah. But yeah. It's, not, it's nothing weird. I mean, we, we will expect this mm -hmm. uh, if you have bulk and single. It's not that in ex situ you have different things that in in situ. Yeah. You have more diversity ex situ mm -hmm. and more diversity in one accession than in in situ. I oh, mean, this is the, for me, this is the, mm -hmm. the explanation of this, uh -huh. this well, graphic. It's, it's yeah. good. But when you, when you analyze the bulk samples, you only look at the two most common alleles, right? Everything yeah. else goes away. Yeah. But you still think, even, even with that caveat, that you are capturing somehow more, more diversity. They use frequencies. In bulks, you don't sample the most common alleles you sample every allele in a biallelic SNP. If there's more than two alleles, we don't include that in any analysis, whether it's a bulk or an individual. And what we determine is the frequency of each allele at that locus. So it's, you sample, as long as you can sample it, yeah, it's not super rare in that population and you miss it in the plant, you capture it in a bulk. It's just in low frequency. Sorry. Uh, thank you. I was just curious. I mean, I think when you make these diagrams, it will spread things out. But what is the actual sort of percentage of diversity if you, you know, look within that? Is it that there's overall like 1% or is it 10% or what? Yeah. How, how diverse are these within this where's, um, race? Where's our, our molecular geneticist? Did he go? Yeah, it's more than that. It's, it's, it's point 0.3 or something like that. In terms of, yeah. well, you have yeah. um, the colors determine the the, the town from which is coming every 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 sample, and the diversity over there you can see that is, is not that much. We can um, separate groups, but it's not more than point 0.3 probably. Yeah. Uh, Denise, this is such a neat study. I mean, it's, it's uh, I mean, A, the data set and, and the insights that you were presenting, but also this data set could help. You know, there are, if you listen to the big wide world, there are lots of questions around the topic of uh, genetic diversity curation and so on. And maybe together we could just, as well as see the com comms team there, just sit down and say, what are the questions out there and how can we use this data set to address those questions? For example, how relevant is in situ versus ex situ uh, mm -hmm. conversation or how much are these land races contaminated? I don't know whether we can say that. Uh, I mean, in terms of are they, there's a concern, you know, everything gets just uh, taken over by, they cross pollinate with hybrids in terms of as well to say, you know, this is the evidence of and I don't know whether we can say that. Um, so, so in terms of maybe to just have a brainstorm of saying, in addition to more the narrow uh, disciplinary questions, what wider questions are there from the public audience? What, I mean, you know the international treaty discussion that is a very good reflection of the concerns that are in, um, that as well are, I mean, they influence decision makers up to very high levels. And I think this is such a good data set to, 
to explain some of these things, yeah? Mm -hmm. So you may want to do that. The other question I have, and as well for maybe the awareness of, of everybody, uh, the Mexican land races as they are grown by Mexican farmers are regulated under the Nagoya Protocol. So what did you do in order to at all be able to generate this data set? I mean, in terms of when uh, you were referring to uh, when DGs were also germplasm bank curators. <laughs> mm. You want to become DG? Uh, the, no. uh, <laughs> so those times are over. But yeah. essentially at that time, you know, people, hey, let's collect and things have changed. So how are you dealing with that? Uh, can you just explain so people understand yeah. that it's not just about the good idea, but there is more involved? Uh, well, none, none of the seed that we use that comes from the farmers, none of that is accessed into our bank. So it, it, none of it becomes part of our, you know, worldwide distributed collection. So that's the first thing. Uh, we have farmers' permission to use it, but we don't incorporate it into the collection. We, we do the sequencing and... Then we go back out and we talk to them about the results and everything, but we, we don't access that to the bank. Now, the, the big community resource, that you know, the, the gene pool populations, I think we'll have to do some discussion because uh, I think that those do, those do need to be kept uh, you know, for perpetuity. Um, so that's a question for the future, but in my, the first cut is that that belongs to the community. So anything we bring here, like for instance, we did, we did some seed drying experiments with uh, their initial start of building a, their own community seed reserve. They were using very poor, super bad um, practice for, for doing, saving their seed. And so we brought that seed back, we dried it all down correctly, and we, we give it all back. So it doesn't become part of, that's one of the big caveats here is that this does not become part of our collection unless we, we you know, ask for that kind of But you also permission. got the authorities permit, perm, I mean you yeah. also, it was not just a community, the farmer was one, maybe you can just explain as well how you did the country Mexico, how did country Mexico give the consent to this? Well, our main collaborator is Victor Vidal, who works for INIFAP. So he is a completely active partner in all of this uh, research, and he's been working in Hala most of his career. Yeah. So, uh, so we do, you know, work with people there and work with people that you know do this kind of research and are part of the the uh, the yeah. government. Now, I would caution you before you publish this. Uh huh is do sit down because with, with the legal team because the international regulations say this is not only owned by the farmers, it's also the country that gives you the authority. And we have to, and if we publish this, then somebody comes and says, where do you get the authority to do this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it can, if Simit is seen as stealing, I mean, as you say, the, the germ plasm, uh, you were very well aware, it cannot go into our germ plasm bank, but the Nagoya protocol goes further. It is saying traditional knowledge, yeah? So it goes beyond, and even though we find, and everybody finds this very challenging, it can ge get us into hot waters. <laughs> so, A, Number one, I think, is that people are aware if we deal with germplasm from farmer um, communities, I mean, everybody here, uh, times have changed from the old collection. So what was done by uh, in old times, we have to change our practices. Those practices are regulated up to international level. I mean, uh, and we have to follow them. And in this re instance, the moment you go out and publish, you will tell the world we have done this together with, and then there will be the question as well, so what were the underlying permits? So make sure that we have clean uh, paper trail as well to say yes, we took all the consideration into account, yeah? Mm -hmm. And that's just, uh, this is not to be taken lightly. As you know, uh, I mean, you know that all of us know there is maize is more or any genetic resource 
from the country of origin is more than the genetic resource. It's had, it has a deep cultural, social, sentimental value, and that is reciprocated up to the president's office. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, it is a very, very important thing for CIMIT to have to have a gold standard reputation in terms of how we honor uh, that um, yeah. ownership. Yeah. We we did ha we did have a discussion with the legal department here in December about uh, everybody I guess who works with directly with community was was called in for a discussion on that. And we were told that there was going to be a, a, uh, a workshop given to us to tell us what we need to do. And that, that has not happened yet. Yeah. I mean, there are two aspects. One <coughs> aspect is as well but what we are working up is there are, in addition, I mean, these are genetic resources regulations we were just discussing that are applicable in any country that we are working in. There are very few countries that would not be following this. I mean, you know, we follow drivers' regulations. We do not steal from each other. I mean, those are countries' laws and regulations, and these are just simply a different set of countries' law laws and regulations. I mean, the other thing that we were made aware more recently is when we work with indigenous community, and uh, we have to follow additional standards, and that is what they were referring to. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we can have together a look in terms of, I do think uh, that a lot was done, yeah, just to make sure. I mean, when we get approached from uh, in Mexico, or the same would be true probably in Turkey, and in countries where our crops are coming from, is you know there is myth and reality. There is myth of what CIMIT does and we don't do, mm -hmm. and then there is really we need to make sure that the reality of what we actually do is really matching because we don't want to stand there. Uh, yeah. In, in saying, oh, we didn't do that, yeah. So, so, and this is what we call, it's one of the red flag issues for CIMI because it's so core to our reputation, yeah. Yeah, Can I, just yeah. in that sense, it will be really useful if we have a small and short guidelines, uh, what or what or whom we should contact in case we want to do a, yeah. a market study with blue maize or yeah. with, yeah, yeah. because, uh, we kind of struggle. Sometimes yeah. we get a clear answer, sometimes uh, we don't know. So it will be really good, especially now that there is more interest on working on uh, Mexican land races, if we have institutional clear guidelines yeah. and contact point in the legal uh, department. Yeah. No, I think, I mean, we're open. We were told yeah. there was going to be a workshop. We were going to be given instructions, guidelines. We're there, you know, we'll do it for sure. Well, I mean, I yeah. think up to, I mean, we, we have uh, been working on several of that, but up to that as well, I mean, always make sure that Kevin, I mean, as genetic resources program director, if he can't answer, uh, you know, sometimes as well for the legal team, it is, you guys are in, immersed in your field. You understand exactly what you talk about. And now imagine uh, for the legal team, this looks completely different. They, they really don't, you know, and there needs to be an interaction. Now Kevin can help, I can help in terms of trying to move things uh, forward. So to understand, do we have an issue or do we not have an issue? I mean, in this more on the narrow sense, we, I think it would be good if we just take stock before the publication go out of what we have done yeah. and yeah. that we have a, a clean, I do sure. think, I mean, given your consultation, and that has been always the guideline, do this together with national collaborators. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. okay. Yep. Plus, I mean, as well, it is an evolving area because as well within Mexico, there is no standard protocol. Uh, and there is there are issues between, I mean, like, uh, actually, the <coughs> Nagoya protocol is in the environmental section. And so there is not clear clarity there either. Mm. What we just together with our best assessment and together, I mean, uh, yeah, need to assess that we are in safe waters. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I'm, I think it's very important to get the government people out here and show them we are not the devil. We are, you yeah. know, and actually we are, we just are planning. passionate people. <laughs> we are we actually care. just planning right that, I mean, it, uh, <laughs> 
a different kind of workshop uh, exactly about that. And it's not yeah. about that we are not the devil. Is uh, I mean, we have had such interactions. It is to say, I mean, on one hand, we need to show them that we are staying in the law, yeah? Uh, number two, they always, I mean, there are many, many, you know, we can make a list of things like Simit has stolen this germ plasma. I mean, that's, for example, what you find out in the community. But, yeah. you know, there is a, an answer to that in terms of when these decisions were made, guess what? Who was involved in the decision? It was actually FAO, and FAO consists of all the member countries. Mexico was at the table. There was a decision. There is a historical decision making that is the basis for what we do today. Now, what we need to be aware is that these regulations keep evolving. And it's not only that Mexico say, yes, we are a member of Nagoya Protocol, but then it means that they are starting to implement and refining how is the implementation in Mexico, and that we need to keep connected to that to make sure that whatever is valid today, we are implementing today. And, it's, uh, and the issue is it's not just, OK, do we now drive 50 kilometers or 60 kilometers? It's a much more emotional issue. And that is why we need to take care. Yeah. Yep. Good. Uh, to complicate factors a little further, uh, you're working with people, so there are ethical implication, uh, implications there uh, as well. Um, fortunately, uh, in terms of the ethics, and I'm talking as chair of the ethics committee now, um, uh, it's a little bit more simple. Uh, simple. There are just a few steps that you that you need to take, uh, uh, which uh, which will uh, w which will ensure that you are in the clear. Um, and to add to that, um, increasingly, uh, 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 peer-reviewed jur uh, journals are asking you if you have if you're using data which was collected with. Uh, 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 with uh, with subjects uh, mm -hmm. that you ha that you provide the eth uh, the ethics clearance document uh, documents. Otherwise, they will not publish your uh, your uh, your results. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, it really uh, even f uh, from your from your own scientific perspective, it really makes sense to to go through the. The, the 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 few hoops and loops that you have to do in order to get uh, to get your clearance and probably the first time it's going to be a bit of a hassle because it's new but once you've done it then um, uh, the next time you do it for something similar it's relatively easy thank you okay thank you presenters and thank you very much Marianne and everybody is for, for the information that you, very important information that you shared with us with regards to these topics that were discussed at the moment. So one of the objectives of having these seminars is not only to gather, to open up to partnerships within CMIT with other programs, but also to see if there are some suggestions that you can give us if, to find out if there is something that we need to improve in the things that we are doing or there is something that we should do right that we are not doing right at the moment. Um, so thank you and see you again in the next series of GRP seminar. <laughs>